Here's a peek at what guests had to say after the show. We're back on the internet. Um, before we get to the questions from the audience, I thought maybe somebody on the panel might want to, because I saw the looks on your faces mm. when I was reading that about Ronald Reagan, and I know your book has a lot to do with Ronald Reagan. Um, so if anybody has anything to say, I'm sure you probably agree with most of what I said about right. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> it was incontrovertible. I was only dealing in facts. One but... thing about that and the, and the subject of inequality, and something I enjoyed your book very much, by the way, but the thing I think that you forget is that the post-war era was economically really unusual in the United States. You had most of Europe economically off the map. You had most of the Asian competitors off the map. That's true. Uh, men's incomes in the United States peaked in 1973. They've been declining my entire life, and that's really the source of what we have with the situation with inequality now. The only reason household incomes went up was because more women went into the workforce. Uh, what happened was you had just a really unusual, unsustainable situation that started in the early 1950s and lasted until about the mid-70s when the rest of the world came back online economically and we were no longer manufacturing while it's the only game in town. And any, you know, explanation but, of what happened to the you, country economically okay. during that time... But you cannot deny now. also that Reagan cut taxes way back on the wealthy. We used to have much higher tax rates on, on the wealthy. And also this idea that somehow cutting taxes magically produces right. more revenue, which has sure. been disproven over and over again, but which is still by, by me among absolutely... Other, and Kevin, you're... By me among other people, but that's not a source of income inequality. The source of income inequality simply has to do with no, the fact that you've got a, global markets. Just saying but, that's but another Kevin, thing. you're right. There were these glo global, globalizing forces that, you know, that changed our economy, but it became a green light for business to take maximum advantage. You mentioned that Apple, you know, avoided paying taxes to the fullest extent of the law. Who wrote those taxes? Congressmen. Actually, they were written by lobbyists who were paid by companies like Apple. And that's something that changed over the last generation. And it didn't have to happen even if we had globalization. So I'd say there are blind economic forces. There's also decisions by leaders, and that's one of them. And I, I, one thing, Reagan was not elected in 1980 out of <clears throat> the American people rejecting uh, Jimmy Carter's economic policies, although the economy was in the toilet. It was the Iranian hostages. That was a big thing, yeah. It was, it was the Iranian hostage crisis. Carter looked excessively weak and excessively impotent, and the average American, I, you know, I was in high school at the time, but people were, were, uh, were basically thinking of that. Well, but let me say, th let me say this about Reagan. I, I think it's hard to fine. argue that Reagan did not work in tandem with the Pope with Margaret Thatcher the and Pope. helped defeat, yes, the Pope, and helped defeat oh, communism. Communism, yes. And, you know, for well, me, it's a very special subject because I was in a communist country at that point. I was born in Nicaragua. I went through a civil war. I lived through communism, and we fled to the United States of America, and that's how I became an American. My father was a freedom fighter, and but for the strength of Ronald Reagan standing up against communism, okay. we might have lost okay, all of Central but, America. But, but the, I, I will concede that Reagan... Okay. Wow. One. Wait, 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 wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I will concede that Reagan played his time. role in the, in the fight against communism, which was to come in in the last act. He didn't play it more than every other president before him. Oh, you think Jimmy Carter played it? Yeah, he boycotted the Olympics in 1980. John F. Kennedy stood up to them in Cuba. That was a much, much more important thing that John Kennedy did. This, this world would, might be gone if he hadn't handled that correctly. They were all cold warriors. You know, Bill, and, and, and I, this I, idea that only Reagan... I mean, the Soviet Union was about to fall anyway. That's intrinsic in what you believe about communism, but it doesn't what work. Listen I said, that he and worked it, in tandem with Pope John Paul II and Margaret Thatcher, and the three of them stood up against communism But what he did was the enforce the Truman Doctrine. Right. It was the Democratic... Bill, I, I agree with Truman. Which Jimmy Carter had not. Yeah. I agree with every word you said about Reagan. I would add... He also raised taxes many times by working with Democrats in Congress, which is something no Republican is going to do today. So it shows you everything you said is true, and it shows you how far it's fallen since Reagan, that there are these ways in which he was statesmanlike that Republicans but, but today again, are not But again, the only reason he raised of. taxes is because he lowered them so far to begin with that they had to. But you're right. Back then, they believed job one is keeping the budget sort of in balance. So they did it. But again, where we started with taxes and where we ended with taxes, Reagan-wise, was night and day. Do you know why Reagan couldn't win a Republican primary today? Because he was the first politician to sign a law legalizing abortion. In California? Yeah, as governor of California. First guy to sign a law legalizing no-fault divorce. First guy to sign a law legalizing abortion. 
Um, if Mitt Romney had done something like that, no one ever heard his name. First okay. uh, president to have been divorced. Yep. I think. But I think... he loved mommy so much. <laughs> Nothing I mean, creepy there. Nothing creepy about calling your wife not. mommy. <laughs> no, I could not agree with you more. All right. Rick, Rick um, created, you know, Rick well created the ideology. Like Tip with a, you know, something that we haven't seen, that kind of bipartisanship that Reagan, with his drinks after work, could foster. Right. Okay. That was Newt Gingrich. He's the guy who really created the, the political atmosphere that we live with today. And right. he's, that's why I put him yeah. in my book. Right. Otherwise, a moral paragon. Um, that Newt Gingrich. Will Chris Christie's flip-flop in scheduling a special election three weeks before the irregular election, oh yes, this happened this week, harm his potential as a presidential candidate? I don't think it will harm him. I don't but think. it is blatantly political for the governor who says, I'm not like every other politician. Well, obviously he is like every other politician or else he would have this election on the election day. It's only three weeks later. The reason why he doesn't want to have this election on election day is because Democrat Cory Booker will be on the ballot then and it will bring out a lot of Democrats. You know this is true. Don't shake your head at me. Phil, Come on. Phil, you know this, this is, is true. This is Cory Booker that didn't have the guts to run against uh, Chris okay, Christie but you know this governor. is But you know this is why he's having an election three weeks before the other I election. Think I think he did the Democrats the a favor here. Because the only people on the Republican side are going to have time to put together a campaign are going to be like the sort of hardcore conservative Tea Party types are already ready to go. Most of the more moderate Republican candidates have already bowed out of the race. He basically just handed the seats to the not, Democrats. Not only that, but he's made it harder for Cory Booker because it means now that congressmen like Frank Pallone are not going to have to be on the ballot at the same time that they run for Congress in 2014 and they're running. So there's going to be now a Democrat primary, and we shouldn't assume well, that doing, the uh, nominee is going to be Cory Booker. By doing this, it's going to widen his, victor, uh, his margin of victory in the regular election, and he will probably get a bigger coattail, and he'll have more uh, padding in the legislature and get more done when he runs for president. Look, it's smart for him to, to get this off his hands. Nothing wrong it's with a hot potato. To have to, to have to make this kind of appointment can be a curse for any politician, for any governor. Uh, you anger practically anybody, even if you appoint the reincarnation of Mother Teresa. So the quicker he can get it done, the better it is for him. I think it's interesting that we talked about Chris Christie and you went right to potatoes. <laughs> I, I don't think worry that he believed in reincarnation either. I, I, yeah, no, that's right. I wonder if his lap band surgery will work and we will be seeing the final days of making Chris Christie fact jokes. He, he didn't want to have the election, but they've yet to invent Jesus. a surgery that would have prevented him from doing it. <laughs> okay, Tom, since your shift, do you find yourself being drawn to different types of directorial projects? Well, um, I mean, Nutty if professor. You very funny. Yeah, yeah. Ace Ventura, what if, I mean. Yeah, I still love those movies. I mean, I love I'm laughter. glad you are not renouncing them. No, movies. of course not. Okay. Laughter, to me, is a sacred art. It Sullivan's helps Travels, you're like that yeah. guy, right. I Make hope people not. laugh. Doesn't he die in the end as a homeless guy? In, at the end of Sullivan's Travel? Like I said. Like I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that up, no, no, uh, but, I'm real but happy in to be Sullivan's here. Travels, he, yeah, yeah. he, you know, he goes on yeah. the road, and what he finds out is what yeah. do people need? They need to laugh. Yeah, yeah. Well, I knew that before. It's not like I ever renounced the films that I did. They're all in their own way, little morality tales, you know, right. little slices of what I hope is a positive energy in the world. Um, but, you know, look, I've changed, so the next film I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this film with Harvey Weinstein at the Weinstein Company. It's a remake of the French film The Untouchables. It was the most popular film in France over the past couple of years, and uh, no one in the English-speaking language country saw it, so we're going to remake it here. So, yeah, some have seen it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's about a quadriplegic, someone paralyzed from the neck down. My mother was also paralyzed from the neck down, and it, this particular film is about a relationship that this wealthy quadriplegic has with an inner city youth, and it's about how they really see uh, each other for who they are and not what social status says they are. Who couldn't make that funny? <laughs> thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, panel. It actually is fun. <laughs> it's Real Time with Bill Maher, Friday night at 10. Ask Bill and his guests your questions right after the show at hbo.com.